Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the May Social Distancing Hour hosted by Advocates for the West. Uh, my name is Anna Dimitriades. I'm the Director of Communications and Outreach at Advocates. Um, we are joined this evening for our webinar, Wolves in the West, by um, Tim Coleman, who is the Executive Director of Kettle Range Conservation Group. And they are a client of ours in a case that we'll be talking about tonight concerning wolves in the Colville National Forest in Washington. Um, Talisi Brooks, staff attorney at Western Watersheds Project, is also on this evening. And she uh, co-counsels on that case with us and also uh, works with us on other cases dealing with wolves and predators in the West. Uh, nice to have you here, Talisi. And uh, Garrick Dutcher, who is the re oh, I, I research and I'm sorry, Garrick, your title again. Research and Program Director. Thank you. I knew it was a, a director. Um, yeah, Research and Program Director for Living with Wolves. We're really glad to have you guys on. Uh, we have not worked on a case with you guys before, but uh, we have long admired Living with Wolves and the work that you and your family have done over the many years to protect wolves in Idaho. So super pleased to have you with us. Um, and then from our team is Lori Rule, who is our senior attorney in the Oregon office. Um, and she will be moderating this evening and kind of uh, helping with the flow of our program. So we are really glad to have Lori on. She is also uh, working on the Colville case as our uh, lead attorney on that case. So um, just a few little housekeeping things as those of you who are joining us are kind of signing on here. Um, I am going to hop off in a few and just uh, share my screen, which will be our slideshow presentation, and then we'll hand it over to our panelists. Um, and then if you have questions throughout the program, which I'm sure you may, uh, you can use the Q&A button um, down at the bottom of your screen and send us questions that we will answer uh, at the end of the program, or if it seems pertinent at the time, we may interject a question throughout the program, but for the most part, we'll just save your questions for the end. Um, so please do send us questions as we go along and then we'll get to that at the end of our program. Um, anything else before I hop off, you guys? Are we good to go, Lori? Okay, I'm gonna turn off my audio and video and share my screen. Okay, uh, I guess we are rolling now because Anna is off and the, and the slides are on. So as Anna mentioned, I'm Lori Rule, Senior Attorney at Advocates for the West. I've been working on some wolf issues, but frankly, I'm not going to do much of the talking tonight. I'm going to leave that to our other participants on the panel here who work very extensively with wolves in Washington and in Idaho. Uh, and we're very happy to have them on board. Uh, and I've worked, I'm working with uh, Tim on the Colville case, and I've worked with Talisi on, on many cases, including some involving wolves. So it's going to be exciting to, to hear them speak. Uh, I'm just going to introduce briefly uh, the Washington work. We'll talk about the, uh, the wolves in Washington first, and then we'll move on to Idaho after that. Um, so Tim and I will be talking about um, the case that we are bringing against the Colville National Forest. But just for a brief background before I turn it over to Tim to get into more of the facts and specifics, uh, wolves in Washington, like in most of the US, were mostly extirpated by the 1930s. Uh, they were not reintroduced uh, once, the, uh, once the animal was listed under the Endangered Species Act. They were not reintroduced into Washington like they were in Idaho in the mid 1990s. And so wolves came back to Washington because they dispersed from Idaho or from Canada, starting in about the early 2000s. And um, by 2008, I believe, was when they discovered the first two packs in Washington state. By 2012, they were up to around 40 wolves. Uh, and then by 2014, they counted a little over 100 wolves in the state, uh, but that still was only 10 breeding pairs in the entire state of Washington. 
Most of the wolves in Washington are found in the northeast corner of the state. Uh, and that's an area that Tim is very familiar with. And he, I'm going to turn it over to him to talk about uh, the wolves, uh, particularly the, the packs in Northeast Washington and what really is the biggest limiting factor on wolf expansion in the state of Washington. So Tim, take it away. All right, thank you, Lori. Um, it's good to be here. And um, uh, just as a pretext, I was on the Wolf Advisory Group for the State Department of Fish and Wildlife from 2015 until I got kicked off last August for being involved in litigation against the department. So I have firsthand experience in this. I uh, saw my uh, second wolf in the wild in the Keller Range. It was dead, um, shot in, uh, I believe it was 2015. and. Um, you know, the thing about the Kettle Range and Northeast Washington in particular is a super good habitat. Um, you know, it's, uh, the Kettle Range is actually a southern extension of the Monashi Mountains of Canada. And so um, a lot of wild country to the north research that's, that was done um, by the state uh, um, uh, biologists and others um, proved that the, the connector connecting bridge for wildlife migration between the Cascade Mountains and the Rocky Mountains was through the Kettle Range. So, I mean, it's, there's a lot of reasons for it, but in particular, there's an absolutely excellent ungulate base here. Um, you know, I hadn't seen an elk in so many years. I saw a dozen below my house a week ago. Um, the one thing that I've seen again and again is that wolves are affecting ungulate behavior. So that we're seeing more and more ungulates uh, grouped up in bunches, 50 mule deer down by Curlew Lake, where there's lots of people even, and whitetails, including being bunched up now too. So it it you know there's the majority of wolves that have been killed in Washington. Let's move on to the next slide, please. Uh, or maybe my screen's frozen. I don't know. Um, is is because of the excellent habitat that we have here. And unfortunately, and a lot of wild country, even though it's broken into pieces, um, 22 roadless areas in the Colville National Forest, but about 230,000 acres only of, of wildlands. But still, it's just really rugged, really good uh, wolf habitat in the valleys. And, um, and of course, the majority of wolves that have been killed have been killed on um, the Colville National Forest. I think I'm going to follow this on my own screen. Um, so um, the South Fork of Deadman Creek, the CC allotment, this is where three packs were killed for one producer, one rancher, um, Diamond M. And you can see there that it's dense habitat, dense forested, um, um, structure, the rolling mountains, those mountains are quite a bit steeper than they look. There's a lot of terrain traps in those mountains. Um, and basically there's five separate um, uh, pastures within that allotment. So, you know, the, the agency, the Forest Service can move, can have the producers move their livestock to different pastures when they know, for instance, that there's a den or um, a rendezvous site, and uh, and and um, so uh, this uh, the next slide here. I hope you're seeing is the uh, sole survivor of the Sherman Pack um, that um, Daryl Smith, a uh, uh, habitat biologist, ID'd as a female, um, likely the last survivor of the Sherman Pack. This is one of the few wolves that has been killed that wasn't killed on public lands. Okay, most of them have been killed on public lands, either state or national forest lands. And I was lucky enough to walk up on this gal, um, the only the third time in my life I've ever seen a wild wolf. Um, and I mean, it was just amazing. Okay, it's everything that they say it is. <laughs> and, you know, so what's the problem with the Colville? I mean, it's got We've got a lot of uh, ranchers out there. Okay, we got, uh, you saw on that one um, um, uh, map of the uh, pack um, uh, locations in the Northeast. 
Um, we, we, got, we just seem to have one place in particular that's become a sink for wildlife. That is uh, for wolves. They're, they're going there and they're ending up dead again and again and again. And, you know, I mean, 90% of uh, the, uh, the lethal removals have occurred on the Colville National Forest. And most of the wolves have been killed for one producer. So, I mean, it's like, clearly, there's a problem there. And, you know, if, um, you know, it's like, so to summarize, what we've got is we've got a lot of packs spread out across the northeast. Um, the habitat biologists for the state um, say that basically a lot of those areas are reaching saturation. That is that the packs are defending their territory and they're not allowing new wolves to come in except maybe young adult females, occasionally an adult male. Um, and they're becoming source populations, which is what we're trying to achieve in Washington State is the source populations migrate out, but we still don't have wolves in South uh, West Washington. And a lot of the wolves are ending up dead getting stuck in the, the sink or the, tra the trap of uh, the Central Kettle River Range. So 13 mile um, roll this area. Um, you can see it's beautiful. It's Rocky Mountains, you know, just like you'd see, you could see in Wyoming, Montana, or Idaho. It's very similar to that. And uh, this uh, 13 mile roll this area is where we have three wolf family territories overlapping. And the bottom line of this is the Colville National Forest, the U.S. Forest Service manages habitat. They lease livestock allotments, okay? Just, they essentially sell the forage just like they sell timber. And they have a responsibility to make sure that uh, the environment is protected um, for the good of all um, uh, citizens. And um, of course, 68% of the forest is in grazing allotments. So it's a big, it's a big issue. On most alignments, there are no problems whatsoever. So that's uh, that's my presentation. Thank you. Hey, Lori, can I? I'm going to interject really quickly here because I think that we are we having technical difficulties on your end. Are you guys able to see the slides that I'm showing? Because I'm having a hard time tracking where you are in the presentation. So I just want to make sure that. Um, yeah, you, you skipped around a little bit. I think if you move move forward one slide. OK, it's just. Um, I, yes. this, what are you seeing right now? So this is, oh, so you don't know. So this the slide that's up there now is the one that says bottom line, the US Forest right. Service manages habitat. Yeah, I got it. I'm sorry. I got a text from uh, one viewer saying that they couldn't see what was what was on the screen. So I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. So if you all are seeing what I'm seeing now, then I think we should be good. Okay, and you can just leave it there because that'll okay. transition into into my stuff. Um, Excellent. Thank you. So as Tim mentioned, um, you know, the Colville National Forest has uh, many grazing allotments. And a lot of those grazing allotments, there are not significant conflicts with wolves because the ranchers on those allotments do some things to, to help mitigate the conflicts. Um, but one, one rancher in particular, Diamond M Ranch, uh, is, is, um, is, not, is not a willing participant in a lot of those best management practices. And therefore, um, his, uh, what is, is it five allotments, Tim? Five or six allotments that Diamond M manages um, are the, you know, the allotments that are responsible for the vast majority of lethal wolf control actions, not only on the Colville, but in the entire state of Washington. And so it's like 85% um, of the lethal wolf control actions that have occurred in Washington to date are due to the actions um, of Diamond M Ranch and their, their grazing on and around the Colville National Forest. So it's clear, you know, who, <laughs> what the problem is. Um, and that's where the litigation comes into play because the Colville National Forest has essentially turned a blind eye to this problem. Um, so the, uh, before I get into the specifics, you'll see the second bullet here is talking about Forest Service's land management plan. And for those of you, um, probably most of you know this, but um, 
national forests are managed under different levels of management planning. And so at the top level, there's usually a forest plan that covers the entire forest and sets direction guidelines for how to manage the forest uh, and different you know, management directives for, for uses of the forest. So that would include um, timber harvest, it would include grazing, it would include recreation, it would include mining, all of the different multiple uses of the forest are included in a forest plan, as well as direction to protect resources. So there's also direction in forest plans to protect wildlife and to protect water quality and to protect vegetation uh, and cultural resources and so forth. And so you have this top level forest plan that provides direction. And then underneath that, the agency issues site specific decisions for every site specific action it wants to take. And so if it's going to harvest timber, it will issue a, you know, a decision for a specific timber sale. If it's going to authorize grazing, it will issue specific grazing permits and annual, um, annual instructions that go along with those permits that set direction on how to manage that specific activity in that specific location. And so in the Colville case, we have brought challenges to both levels of Forest Service planning for, um, again, turning a blind eye to this problem between wolves and livestock. And so um, first I'm gonna talk, so Anna, can you uh, move to the next slide? Which should be, yeah. So this is just the, the other one that goes along with mine this is the, the last slide for, for my presentation. So first I'm gonna talk about our challenge to the forest plan, and then I'll talk about the site specific um, challenges we, we brought in our case. And this case was filed, oh my God, now I can't remember. When did we file this, Tim? I think it was in 2020, at some point in 2020. The case has been fully briefed. We just had oral argument on May 24th. So that was just, God, Monday of this week, time flies, um, in front of the judge you know, who the heck knows, because this judge was uh, very non-responsive and unemotional, so it's impossible to tell what she's thinking. But nevertheless, the case is fully brief and we had argument, so we should be getting a decision at, at some point. But we have some strong claims in here. Uh, number one, you know, our forest plan claims come under the National Environmental Policy Act as well as the National Forest Management Act. And under NEPA, National Environmental Policy Act, you know, the main thing we're arguing is you didn't take a hard look at this whole conflict issue. I mean, this is a big deal. There's wolves repeatedly getting lethally removed, not every year, but you know, multiple years, repeated removals of entire packs due to this one grazing permittee and his five allotments. And yet nowhere does the forest plan talk about this issue. It doesn't talk about the return of the wolves to the forest. It doesn't talk about the baseline conditions of the wolves. It doesn't talk about wolves and how it um, how wolves are affected by livestock grazing. Period. It certainly doesn't talk about the conflicts between wolves and this grazing permittee Diamond M. Uh, all of that completely avoided in the forest plan. And so our primary claim under NEPA is that they didn't take a hard look at this very important issue that obviously is having an effect on this species, which is a Forest Service sensitive species. Okay, so problem number one under NEPA, they also failed to consider any kind of alternative actions um, that would look at, you know, mitigating these conflicts or dealing, ad somehow addressing these um, wolf livestock conflicts on the forest. So that was our primary NEPA claim uh, against the forest plan. Pretty simple um, and pretty blatant, uh, it seems like. Um, and then under NIFMA, the National Forest Management Act, we also brought a couple of claims. First of all, NIFMA has a, a set of regulations that implement the act. So the act, you know, obviously is what Congress passes and then the agency itself implements regulations um, to, to further define what it has to do under the act. And the NIFMA regulations have two different requirements that we focus on. The first requirement is that an agency is supposed to determine the suitability of Forest Service lands for um, livestock grazing, which means they're supposed to look at um, whether the lands are capable of being grazed based on physical features and whether they're suitable for grazing based on conflicts with other resources, such as if the recreation conflicts are too high, maybe it's not suitable for grazing. Or specifically, if conflicts with wildlife are too high, 
it may not be suitable for grazing. And they need to do that analysis in the forest plan. Yet they did not. And so that is one of our key claims uh, in this case under the National Forest Management Act is that they just never, they never even considered whether these grazing allotments are suitable for grazing due to the conflicts between wolves and the cattle that graze those allotments. And then the other thing that the NIFMA regulations require are to ensure the viability of all wildlife populations across the forest, which means across the forest, so that you want to have wolf populations that are uh, ensure uh, that can remain viable, that will persist for the long term across the Colville National Forest. Well, we have this one hole, like Tim mentioned, where they keep being removed and there are no wolf packs because of these conflicts and the lethal removals that occur as a result of the conflicts. And so we argue that the uh, forest plan did not ensure the viability of wolves because it didn't even address this problem at all. And the Forest Service's response, interestingly, was that they said, oh, we ensured viability of wolves because we ensured viability of all wild general wildlife species based on this other representative species that you know, can represent all of these different other wildlife. And the representative species is the wolverine. So despite the fact that the wolverine uses completely different habitat from wolves, and has completely different threats than wolves do. Like road density is a big threat to wolverine, habitat impacts are a threat to wolverine. The threat to wolves are the lethal removals due to livestock conflicts. And so the two species are completely different. The wolverine cannot represent the wolf at all, but yet that's what the Forest Service relied on uh, in their forest plan to claim that, oh, all viability of wildlife is ensured for all species across the forest. So those were our general claims, uh, sort of broad brush uh, claims uh, against the forest plan. And then we also brought claims against the individual specific grazing allotment decisions. The Forest Service's response throughout, the, um, throughout this case was that, oh, we don't have to deal with grazing issues in the forest plan because we deal with them all at the site specific level. So we don't have to consider the conflicts. We don't have to consider mitigation for how to reduce these conflicts at the forest plan because we do it at the site specific level when we make decisions for particular grazing allotments. Well, guess when the last time was that they made these site specific environmental analyses for these grazing allotments? In the 1970s and 1980s. So it's been 30 to 40 years since they took a close look at the impacts of grazing on the Diamond M grazing allotments on this forest. And gee, wolves were not even around at that time. So our claim on the site specific level is that the Forest Service has failed to supplement these very, very old analyses uh, under NEPA and therefore they're in violation of NEPA by not providing more updated analyses given the change in circumstances and the new information that has arisen since you know, the 1980s and 1970s. Uh, and so that again is another, um, is a, you know, the crux of our case, the challenge to the forest plan and then the challenge to the site specific allotments because basically the forest service is just point, you know, trying to duck everything. They're saying, oh, you know, we don't have to do it in the forest plan, we do it at the site specific level. But then they never do it at the site specific level because they haven't updated their NEPA for those allotments for like 30 to 40 years. So they're trying to, they're playing a shell game and just essentially trying to avoid this issue entirely, um, which it's not gonna go away. So we're trying to force them to address it one way or another, because there are things that they can do um, such as, um, you know, requiring wolves to, or requiring cattle to avoid denning areas and other core wolf areas. There are certainly things that can be done to reduce these conflicts. Um, certainly, you know, obviously closing certain areas would help, but even other mitigation is available. And Diamond M has just been resistant to doing any of that. And the Forest Service has been resistant to forcing Diamond M to take these uh, mitigation measures. And so we're trying to, uh, we're trying to force some action there. So that is a, is what's going on in Washington right now in a nutshell, or at least in the Northeast corner of the state. Uh, and so I'm now going to turn it over to Talisi, who's going to talk about what's going on in Idaho right now and in, in the management of wolves where wolf numbers 
we're in pretty good shape. And then the state took over. So <laughs> that's always a bad thing in Idaho. <laughs> Indeed, never a good thing in Idaho. Um, so I'm going to start by just giving a little bit or sort of a history and a timeline of what happened with wolves in Idaho, uh, just so that you folks can get a sense of um, of like what this whole what the background of this whole conflict or what's going on now is and I see a question I'm just going to look at it real quick. Um, timeline for next steps in the Washington case. Um, I can answer that question, which is essentially the case has been fully briefed and argued. So now we're just going to wait for a ruling and we don't know how long the federal judge will take to rule. We don't really know what her docket looks like or anything like that. So it's probably a few months away. And once uh, the ruling has issued, we may have to brief remedies. Um, so we're not, we don't know, <laughs> stay tuned. That's the answer to that question. Um, so moving on to my presentation about wolves in Idaho. Um, in 1995 to 96, uh, wolves were reintroduced to central Idaho. And at that time, recovery was defined as 10 breeding pairs in Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming for three consecutive years, which was later described as at best a minimum recovery goal. And basically, as soon as wolves started to look like they were getting established, efforts began to delist the species and take uh, Endangered Species Act protections away from them. So in 2002, the Idaho legislature wrote a plan to transfer wolf management from Fish and Wildlife Service to the states, uh, which committed to um, maintaining 15 breeding pairs and 150 wolves in Idaho. Um, and again, uh, delisting kind of seemed like a prospect in 2007 and 2008. So in 2008, Idaho Fish and Game adopt a different wolf management plan. And this one uh, said that they would maintain a population of 518 to 732 wolves through the five year post delisting period. However, uh, they withdrew that plan in 2010. Um, Wolves, the Fish and Wildlife Service issued a rule delisting wolves in the Northern Rockies in 2008, but that rule was set aside or vacated by the district court for the District of Montana because there was no, um, there was no evidence of genetic exchange between the three populations of wolves. And um, in 2009, Fish and Wildlife Service issued a new rule delisting uh, wolves or well, it was a new delisting rule requiring Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming to each maintain a population of 150 wolves. That rule was also vacated by the District of Montana. And then in 2011, Congress directed Fish and Wildlife Service to reissue that 2009 delisting rule, and the Fish and Wildlife Service complied. And that is why wolves um, are no longer or are, yeah, are no longer listed in Idaho. So what that, you know, what that really shows is this whole process has been largely political and not so much governed by science, um, which is what we see in Idaho's management. So once wolves were delisted, uh, wolves were managed by the state of Idaho with Fish and Wildlife Service oversight for five years. And once wolves were delisted, Idaho started sort of inching towards more and more liberal wolf killing policies. Um, and so that's kind of what I've outlined here. Like in December 2011, um, Idaho Fish and Game adopted a predation management plan for the Lolo and Selway zone in uh, central Idaho that allowed for a 11 month wolf hunting and trapping season. Um, and that year, Idaho Fish and Game also began contracting with wildlife services to kill wolves in the Lolo zone each year. And later in 2014, it adopted a statewide elk plan that called for reducing wolf population up to 75% where elk weren't meeting objectives. And then it created the Wolf Depredation Control Board, uh, which is essentially a fund 
to fund lethal wolf control. And none of the funds that are put in the wolf De depredation control board budget, $400,000 of which come from the general fund, which is our tax dollars, can be spent for non-lethal control, um, which is shown to be more effective than these lethal methods. Um, so the five, the five year post delisting period expired in 2016 and up and, and at that point, Idaho Fish and Game stopped keeping very close track of the wolf population. Up until wolf delisting, it had used aerial counts and wolf collar data to come up with wolf population estimates, but it stopped doing that. And so in 2017 and 2018, um, it just sort of said, well, there's still wolves there. So we assume there's enough and we're doing fine. Um, and in the meantime, it kept coming up with these more and more permissive hunting and trapping seasons and also um, channeling money into the Foundation for Wildlife Management, which is a North Idaho based group that essentially pays wolf bounties to successful trappers, which they call reimbursement to trappers for their expenses. And those, uh, those reimbursements can be up to $1,000 per wolf, uh, or at least they could last time I looked into it, maybe more now. Um, so um, nobody really liked that Idaho Fish and Game wasn't keeping track of the wolf population. Anti-wolf people wanted to know how many wolves there were so they could justify more wolf killing. And uh, pro-wolf people wanted to know how many wolves there were because we were afraid they were going to be extirpated by these more liberal hunting and trapping policies. So in 2019, they came up with a new wolf counting method based on camera trap surveys that they had set up throughout the state. And they estimated that the year end wolf population was about a thousand wolves and the high population was 1500 wolves. And it also is instituted new expanded hunting and trapping seasons. And so this chart kind of shows the result of these policies. Um, this was uh, something from an Idaho Fish and Game presentation. And this shows sort of like the amount of wolves that were killed. So you can see in fall of 2019, after these policies were instituted, and there was a high of 583 wolves killed, which is, you know, really, quite a lot of wolves when you consider that the year end population was only known to be a thousand that's 60% of the year end population. And the, the toll of that is serious. So if you could go to the next side slide, please, Anna. Um, this is just a screenshot from uh, some records we got from Idaho Fish and Game. But if you can see this, it shows this was uh, an obvious pup that was killed, no tooth taken, frozen. So it had frozen in that trap. Or, and then if you go down, there was a pup, 18 pounds killed uh, with its occipital lobe damaged. So how would a pup, a wolf pup, have its occipital lobe damaged? Then you see pup, 17 pounds, pup, 16 pounds. So people are killing wolf pups. And these pups, if you had, I mean, you can't see the full spreadsheet that we had, but these pups were killed for supposedly stalking livestock. Well, a uh, 18 pound pup is smaller than my West Highland Terrier. So, you know, this, this is not a pup that poses a great threat to livestock. Um, so in response to these kinds of this new information we got, we, we did a few things. We started sending public records requests to Idaho Fish and Game to try and understand what was going on, trying to get a better sense of both the extent of the wolf killing and um, the wolf population numbers. Um, there were a couple of protests that were held at the Idaho Capitol over the years. Um, we began, Western Watersheds Project began testifying at Idaho Fish and Game Commission hearings and attending meetings of the Idaho Wolf Control Board. Um, and we drafted op-eds, which we still do. 
And, but the most important thing that we did is we identified and starting ta started talking to and sharing information with some of our allies in the conservation community, which include many of you. Thank you for all your hard work. Um, and so through that, we have been able to have a better understanding of what's going on, but that hasn't really allowed us to keep bad things from happening. And so in that leads us to what's just happened, which is this year, the Idaho legislature passed S 1211 and it was signed into law by Governor Little. It takes away management authority for wolves from the Idaho Fish and Game Commission and essentially goes into setting seasons on wolves. And while it maintains the classification of wolves as a big game species, it allows wolves to be essentially treated like predatory wildlife. So that means killed by all methods that can be used to kill coyotes, including aerial gunning, night hunting, and potentially if they're reauthorized for use in Idaho, um, M44s. Um, it also increases the Wolf Control Board's total funding to over $800,000 a year. Um, and it allows the Wolf Control Board to hire private contractors. So theoretically, the Wolf Control Board could contract with trappers like people who are involved with the Foundation for Wildlife Management and pay public funds to those people. And it also allows unlimited wolf trapping on public lands or private lands, sorry. And that is, there was similar legislation to this that also passed in Montana. So, I mean, the bottom line, here are our takeaways, <laughs> which is that science, not politics, should guide wildlife management. Um, killing wolves doesn't work to prevent livestock conflicts. Non-lethal deterrents work much better. Um, you know, wolves aren't eating all the elk. The state shouldn't be using our taxpayer dollars to kill wolves. And finally, all this just shows that the species needs ESA protection to add federal oversight over this extinction agenda. And just today, the Center for Biological Diversity, the Humane Society, and the Sierra Club filed a petition to relist um, the gray wolf in light of these policies. Um, and so on that cheery note, I will turn it over to Garrick and uh, invite him also to add anything I may have missed because he's been at it uh, much longer than I have. Thank you, Talisi. You did a great job. I think you covered it very well. Uh, and thanks everyone for tuning in tonight. Uh, it's great to be able to spend some time with you, um, taking some time out of your evening. Appreciate it very much. Uh, I've been asked to talk about wolf ecology, the uh, ecological role that wolves play. Uh, and you know, clearly they can only do so in significant numbers. Um, you know, 150 wolves in the state of Idaho is um, basically nothing. Uh, and what this law suggests is that things won't change until they reach that level. Uh, they wouldn't return management to the uh, Idaho Fish and Game completely until reaching somewhere around that number or that number. Uh, so, and just to put that into context, you know, Yellowstone is obviously a great uh, case study for the ecological effects of wolves. Um, and in Yellowstone, where wolves occupy about 75% of the park, uh, that's an area, uh, the entire park is 3,500 square miles, roughly. Um, Idaho is 84,000 square, 84, square miles, about 24 times the size of Yellowstone. Uh, and about 75% of Idaho is occupied by wolves as well. So in Yellowstone, at the end of uh, last year, there were 123 wolves. Um, and, and so proportionately, that's a greater concentration than even uh, Idaho at 1,500 wolves, which was the peak estimated population um, uh, estimated with a uh, unproven science, uh, not proven scientific method. Uh, it hasn't been peer reviewed. Uh, the camera trap uh, way in which they're count counting wolves is very uh, suspect at this point until there's some good peer review study to support it. Um, okay, so 
I've mentioned that Yellowstone is a great case study in ecology for wolves. Uh, back in the mid 1920s, wolves were completely finally eradicated um, after a long campaign to do so. Uh, bears and mountain lions had also been uh, oppressed in, in their numbers. It wasn't viewed that uh, a national park should have a lot of these toothy carnivores. Um, so in Re response to that, elk grew uh, in numbers greatly in, in short order, and it was soon noticed that they were impacting the vegetation along streams and rivers, uh, and the park then began culling and, uh, and exporting wolves. Um, However, politicians and hunter groups uh, pressured the parks to stop exporting and calling, and then uh, they did so, and the population began to uh, grow again and has had grown for quite some time. Uh, and there was clearly a need then for the restoration of these large carnivores, uh, bears, mountain lions, and wolves. Mountain lions began to recover on their own uh, during the 1980s. Uh, bear numbers also began uh, growing at that time. Uh, and then in the mid 1990s, as Talisee had mentioned, there was reintroduction of wolves into Yellowstone as well as Idaho. Um, and at that point, Yellowstone began having a full complement of its native predators. So what were the effects of that? What happened? Well, many of you, most of you are probably familiar with trophic cascades, and I'm gonna to try to detail a few of those in a few minutes. Uh, next slide, please, Anna. So, uh, the leading carnivore in the absence of the large carnivores became the coyote. Next, next slide, please. Um, the coyotes were the park's most prolific predator for quite some time. And by being that, um, they were, you know, specializing in mid to small size prey. Um, th those, those include mice, pocket gophers, and other, uh, you know, more mid-sized prey, such as the, the lagomorphs, you know, rabbits and hares. Um, and then eventually with the return of wolves, um, the wolves began to compete with, displace and kill uh, many of the coyotes and bring them back into normal uh, numbers. Uh, what would be more representative of, of a complete ecosystem? So with fewer coyotes in the park, uh, these smaller prey uh, species became more available, more abundant for other uh, mid-level carnivores, such as badgers, skunks, and also birds of prey uh, like hawks, and next slide please, owls as well. Uh, so, and then coyotes, like many other predators, specialize in certain prey species during certain times of year. Uh, one of the things they like to specialize in were, were fawning pronghorn. So every spring when the pronghorn had their fawns, uh, coyotes would uh, have an impact on that population. So coinciding with the restoration of wolves um, was a, a, an increase in the population of pronghorn in the park as well. Next slide, please. The probably the most uh, consequential um, impact of the restoration of wolves to Yellowstone would have been on elk and what happened there. Basically, uh, Elk, under the under predation pressure of wolves and the other large carnivores, stopped lingering for as long in the riparian areas of the park. Uh, with the pressure of predation around, you don't just keep your head to the ground eating every uh, bit of new growth all the way down to the ground. And so that was what was occurring and why there was an impact historically on the streams and rivers was that elk primarily were eating all the new growth. Uh, and so the willows and the aspens and uh, cottonwoods uh, were greatly impacted um, and there wasn't any significant new growth for quite a, several decades. Um, and this has all been really well studied by the OSU, I think it might be their carnivore lab or I forget uh, forestry department, but OSU um, has a lot of good research on this and so do a number of others, um, including a number of the park biologists as well. Um, so, pardon me, check my notes. Uh, yeah, there were anticipated by the park um, officials that there would be a change in elk behavior and elk numbers in response to the reintroduction. That was in part the idea. Uh, so without uh, wolves, 
or excuse me. So, you know, the plants that the, the elk were eating are really also critical to stream hydro hydrology. They reinforce the banks with their roots. Uh, without them, the streams run faster. They became wider, shallower, uh, and therefore warmer, being heated by the sun and without the shade, uh, and murkier um, because of the erosion. So next slide, please. The stream side that this stream side vegetation has a lot of other values as well. It you know provides nesting and feeding habitat for songbirds, uh, insects like it as well. <clears throat> and uh, then when you know with roots in place, the the streams are deeper, cooler, uh, and cl more clear. It's, you know the typical Rocky Mountain stream generally is slow and meandering. It it doesn't just follow a straight line and become super shallow. It's a rather you know lots of little deep little pools and eddies and such, um, right, which is also a great habitat for fish. Um, and as I mentioned before, the shade also from the vegetation keeps the water um, temperature cooler, which is also vital to all these native species. Next slide, please. So another thing that that helps is, is beaver. Beaver tend to be... Um, you know, they need their food source nearby. They can't travel very far from the water and they do so at great risk. Um, so the, the willows and, and cottonwoods and nearby aspen provide a great food source for them to build their dams and create their own microhabitats, uh, which they, you know, become a, a home for many, many other species. Um, so yeah, beaver, beaver ponds also provide an ideal uh, condition for insect um, life cycles and this is where larvae can grow in calm waters and eventually hatch and and you know go through their life cycles next uh, or actually no not yet <laughs> okay it's fine um uh so yeah insects in all stages are a mainstay and the diets of fish and other other um or trout and other fish trout are sight feeders so they need clear water uh they rely on seeing to hunt their prey um and therefore they do much better in these clear streams rather than murky ones next slide please Another species to benefit are moose. Uh, deep beaver ponds provide security for moose, uh, but they also must keep their body temperature low. They, um, hot days for moose out of water can be lethal. They begin to pant around 57 degrees and in excess of 80 degrees, it can be lethal to them. Um, uh, also the deep uh, ponds provide aquatic plants for the moose to eat, uh, supplying them with essential minerals and fat reserves that get them through the winter. Uh, they have specialized valves on their nose, a little obstru obstructed by this uh, leaf here on this picture. But uh, yeah, they, they, they've got specialized um, valves on their nose that uh, seal so they can dive down for these uh, plants, get their head way down in there uh, and eat these plants off the bottom of the ponds, which wouldn't grow in fast running streams and rivers, uh, at least not in such uh, proliferation. Uh, okay, so what else? Yeah, none of this would be possible, of course, without slow, deep moving water, um, to, you know, for these plants to grow in, um, you know, and, and in shallow, murky, fast flowing, uh, beaverless streams, you're not going to have such a re rich um, biodiversity and ecosystem. Next slide, please. So many changes um, were precipitated by the return of wolves uh, that have impacted elk. Um, you know, now today, Yellowstone wolves have restored elk to what they presumably were prior to the elimination of almost all the large carnivores in the park. They're, they're much uh, more alert. They're much more robust. Um, female elk now often stand their uh, ground in, in the uh, face of a, a wolf attack and they can defend themselves defend themselves rather rather successfully compared to what was being seen earlier on in the park um, and in, as a result of that uh, bison are now being hunted by more of the park's uh, wolves now it used to be just the mollies and just a rarity uh, but now we have about 25 percent of the packs uh, parks uh, attacking and uh, living on bison so okay let's see where was i so yeah, the, as the predators um, that chase their prey, as predators that chase their prey, unlike bears and lions that kind of ambush them more so or use sudden force and uh, a, a real quick moment, wolves will move them across the landscape, look for vulnerability. In doing so, um, they've, so, so to speak, they've trimmed the fat out of the elk herd, um, leaving them stronger and more resilient in the process. Uh, let's see, where am I? 
Yeah. So now wolves are turning uh, more, more yeah, their attention to the bison, as I mentioned, um, and you know these continue these changes continue to happen in in front of the uh, observers and the researchers in Yellowstone. Uh, so you know we don't really know what the end result is and how everything will play out because still today changes are occurring, which is really quite interesting. Um, so then here we have a carcass. Now the bounty of a wolf kill feeds tons of other scavengers, whether it's eagles, uh, grizzlies, ravens, et cetera, magpies, you name it. Uh, even the carcass itself can restore uh, you know, vitality to the soil. Um, so next slide, please. This is another thing that wolves do. They bring a boost to the economy, uh, providing uh, local businesses with an economic boon um, with a steady and reliable pulse of wolf watchers. Uh, they're there always. You probably many have seen that being one of them yourselves. Uh, next slide, please. So none of this would at all be possible, um, you know, had large carnivores and, and specifically wolves not been allowed to uh, return to Yellowstone, not have been restored. Uh, so it is, you know, at significant numbers, wolves can have these impacts. 150 wolves running around the state of Idaho uh, won't have any impact. Wolves need to, uh, next slide, please. You know, individuals here and there cannot create this bounty or this balance. A trace population cannot have a broad ecological impact. Next slide, please. So wolves need more than um, you know, to be more than momentary transient visitors or individuals passing through hostile landscapes in search of other wolves. Uh, and, and this is, you know, the contrast we see between Yellowstone and what is uh, it's presumably underway in Idaho and Montana as well, where wolves are persecuted and exploited. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Sun came out. Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you all. Um, it does look like we've got some questions coming in. Um, some of them have been answered online already, but um, I am going to... Um, pop back on here. Hi, everybody. Uh, some of these questions, even though they were answered on uh, online during the presentation, I think probably warrant uh, discussion because I think other folks might be interested in um, hearing the answers. Um, so I'm just going to kind of run through some of these. Uh, I kind of like Pam's question here. Uh, she asks, she's trying to understand the, U the US Forest Service's mentality. Uh, what's in it for them to keep dodging the issue of conflict, particularly with Diamond M? Um, let's go ahead and answer that online or during the discussion here and get a little deeper into that. Okay, uh, do you want me to do that, Anna? Uh, you or Lori, it looks like both of you are on mute or off mute. So yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Tim. Uh, well, as I wrote in the response, it's political. I mean, you know, it's the, I have worked with uh, Diamond M. I've eaten supper with them a couple of times. Nice folks, but don't cross them. And, uh, you know, I think it's, it's similar to what a county commissioner told me a few years ago when I asked him why Diamond M wouldn't like support wilderness in the Kettle Range, seeing as how they don't want to have motorized there and they don't want a bunch of people or disturbances or development. It's like, well, because if you step out of line, you get shot. Um, you know, the, the history goes back to the John Birch Society. So it's, it's political, the biggest rancher in the state um, moves cows all over the West. And so that's the short of it. And one more thing is that the Forest Service, um, the district ranger who used to be the, the range manager since 1996, he's, he's one of them. <laughs> so there, the, you know, that's, that's my answer. Yeah, and I think there's also, I mean, I think part of it too is, I mean, Agencies don't like change. I mean, Diamond M has been grazing for, you know, prop 10, probably decades, I would guess. And um, 
you know, the agency doesn't like to force change. They don't want to have to tell him, no, you can't turn your cows out. I mean, whether it's Diamond M or some other allotment, they just like the status quo. Just keep doing what they've been doing for years after year after year. And, you know, the district ranger, like Tim said, the district ranger is a cattleman himself. You know, the, the employees on the Forest Service go to school with the ranchers kids or see them in the grocery store or whatever. It's it's a local community and everybody's hand in hand and it's it's hard to force change. Everybody just wants to keep keep on doing what they've been doing. Yeah, well said. Um, so Louise asks, uh, what is what are the next legal steps for us to combat the Idaho Montana actions? Talisi, do you want to take that? Well, I mean, I think that we're kind of trying to figure that out. I think that the Center for Biological Diversity, Humane Society, and Sierra Club took a big one when they uh, petitioned to relist the wolves. If that petition is denied, it could be form the basis for a lawsuit potentially. Um, or, you know, the Fish and Wildlife Service may look at the petition and be like, oh, maybe we should relist these wolves since Idaho and Montana are apparently trying to wipe them out. Um, I also think that the actions in Idaho and Montana seriously undermine the rationale for the nationwide wolf delisting rule that the Trump administration put out, uh, I believe it was last year. Um, that rule like it relied on the presence of a robust population in the Northern Rockies to serve as a source of dispersing wolves. And that basis is no longer there. Um, so I think that that's another thing. And then something that we should all be thinking about and that we should be talking to our elected officials about is that states that do this kind of thing and are mismanaging wildlife shouldn't be receiving federal funds. And mm -hmm. typically, states receive federal Pittman-Robertson funds um, to assist with wildlife management. Well, if they're gonna be spending those funds to kill wolves or other carnivores, they or, or even if they're spending other funds to kill wolves and other carnivores, they shouldn't be getting those, they shouldn't be getting those federal funds. Um, and I think that the final thing is, you know, Litigation and law have their advantages for sure as a tool to create change. But I think that also each of us has an important role to play in changing the way wolves are managed. And we need every single person who cares about wolves to be calling their elected officials, writing their elected officials, and calling on Congress and you know our local elected officials as well uh, to do a better job and to not allow this kind of thing to happen. Absolutely. Thanks, Talisi. Um, and I did, so ahead of this presentation, we got a really thoughtful um, message from Karen Balch. Uh, Karen, if you're still on, thank you so much for your, uh, for your questions ahead of time. I sent those uh, questions to our panelists so that they could kind of weave your answers um, or answers to your questions throughout the presentation. But um, I did want to go back to one thing that you had mentioned in your questions, Karen, which was um, that Idaho laws have a 72 hour trap check guaranteeing that any animal uh, in a trap that for that length of time, uh, or that they would, so it, essentially uh, that after 24 hours, an animal is likely to die uh, within the trap, but, our, but Idaho, only, um, Idaho law only requires that you check the trap every 72 hours. Um, so, and, and she for, goes on to talk about, uh, some of the, the new, of uh, the new ways of being able to hunt wolves in Idaho, which, uh, includes night vision goggles and things like that. So, you know, we're really, uh, you know, Idaho is, is really going for it here as far as, um, wolf kills in, in Idaho and, 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 you know, wondering how, how a person might be able to distinguish an animal uh, that's not a wolf using night vision goggles and what are the risks involved? Um, you know, should people on public lands be concerned about their pets? Um, is this something that we should be uh, really bringing to the forefront and talking to our Congress people about? Um, so I, I, Karen, I really appreciate all of the, the questions that you posed there. Um, 
and you know the the question of ethics too whether or not this is an ethical violation to hunt wolves in that way um and i i don't know if that's something that any of you want to discuss further before we hop off here we just have a couple minutes left but i think it's important to talk about sure yeah it's absolutely an ethical violation i mean there's no fair chase hunting when you're using infrared goggles and shooting wolves out of airplanes like that's outrageous and as for being concerned about our pets recreating on public lands, we should be terrified. I mean, not terrified necessarily, but you know, in Idaho, trapping is allowed all over the place on public lands. There's very few restrictions. Um, the last time I checked, I believe the rule was that you could place a trap like five feet from the center line of the trail. It's so, 10 feet now. It's 10, 10 feet. feet from the center line, but but I mean, that's incredibly permissive. Anywhere where you can walk with your dog on a public land trail, you could encounter a trap. Um, and you know, that recently happened to an Idaho state senator whose dog got caught in a trap on public lands. So, I mean, this is a real hazard and it's a real danger. And um, the unfortunate thing is that, you know, the Idaho Fish and Game Commission and the legislators who are now managing this type of thing uh, have been unresponsive to concerns from the conservation community. And instead they're just listening to the trappers and that's got to change. Absolutely, thank About you. About 30 dogs get trapped every year in Idaho. A couple die. It's not uncommon at all. That's yeah, I, I, I worry about that a lot. And I, um, I just want to share that I, I am um, on behalf of Advocates for the West and uh, talking with uh, somebody who may be able to provide information to those of you who are interested about how to release traps and how to identify them. I'm hoping that we can release a, a follow-up uh, presentation to this, follow to this presentation that will uh, provide the public with a better understanding of how these traps operate and ways that you can release your animals from those traps. So I will um, be sure to send that information out. I'm hoping that that's something that we can release this summer so that those of you who are, are concerned, which I'm sure all of you are, um, that that will be information available to you um, because there are ways to release those traps, but it's very difficult. And if you don't have the right tools, then you can't get your animal out. So um, for those of us who do walk our dogs on public lands, that's something that we should all know and, and know how to handle. Um, we are over time. I know we keep getting questions in, um, but I, I really do appreciate everybody's time this evening. And I'm sorry for the technical difficulties this evening. Um, I got several messages that you were not seeing the same slides that I was seeing on my screen. So sorry about that. Um, I will see if I needed to have some sort of Zoom update overhaul on my computer. It's such as the way with technology, it's uh, always fun and really stressful. Um, but I hope that you did enjoy the presentation. We really appreciate everybody being here this evening. And thank you again to all of our panelists. Um, I will be presenting this, uh, this on our YouTube channel. Uh, it'll be on tomorrow afternoon. So I will send all of you an email with that so you can share this presentation with other people if you would like. Um, I hope you do. And like I said, I will um, follow up with uh, more information about traps on public lands. Um, I hope to get that to you all uh, very soon. And um, please do message any of us if you have further questions. Uh, you can get a hold of us via our websites, or I will send out everybody's contact information in our post webinar email that will also include the link to the YouTube video. So um, thank you again, everybody, so much. And uh, we'll see you for our next social distancing hour at the end of June, last Wednesday of June. All right, take care, everybody. Have a great night. Thank you, Anna. Bye-bye. Thank you.